Hope he's gone to Shashti. Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejasvi Navadi Tamastu Ma Vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 and we'll see if we can share the screen. There it is. And there we are, November 19th. Here we just finished our Skanda Shasti Puja literally five minutes ago. <laughs> so fortunate timing that it ended and I was able to attend that and come to this one on time. It's about um, 3 p.m. to 5.20, so two hours, 20 minutes, counting, dressing the deity. Very nice, elaborate Abhishekam. <clears throat> and we'll see what we have in store today. <clears throat> Giving secret gifts. Consistently contributing to your religion has the power to draw spiritual fulfillment and material wealth into your life. This publisher's desk is an explanation of how consistently contributing to your religion has the power to draw spiritual fulfillment and material wealth into your life, which we just said. Giving known as dana in Sanskrit, is built into all aspects of Hindu life. Giving to the holy man, to the astrologer, to the teacher, to a swami or a sadhguru for his support over and above all routine giving to his institution. There is a verse in the Tudukural that states, foremost duty of family life is to serve duly these five, God, guests, kindred, ancestors, and oneself. This is understood by all Hindus. However, the idea that the practice of giving can be a powerful tool for attracting financial abundance is an idea that many Hindus do not have in mind. Two verses in this chapter on hospitality, the Tudukaral provides compelling reasons for giving. If a man cares daily for those who come to him, his life will never suffer the grievous ruin of poverty. And the second verse, those who never sacrifice to care for guests will later lament, we hoarded wealth estranged ourselves, now none will care for us. So this is a key point coming up here. Materialistic thinking holds that. If we hoard all the wealth we get, we will end up with more riches in life's full season, meaning in our latter years. But Tirukkural is saying the opposite. If you use wealth to help others and care for guests, you will prosper more than if you hoarded it. Interesting. And the question for you, why is that? Why is that true? It is because if we generously give to others, we will, by karma's unfailing law, attract more wealth in this and future lives. The merit we earn through giving to others comes back to us through attracting abundance in the future. Nice picture of abundance. 
A uh, Tamil word here, we have some Tamil script. Puniyavan has a double meaning. Interesting. This is just from the lexicon. A person of great religious merit, a lucky person. So the two are obviously the same. We're lucky because we have great religious merit. This concept also appears in astrology readings in which it is clear that an individual will easily attract abundance because of the good he did in past incarnations, such as in this assessment from a computerized chart. So this is a computerized chart of an anonymous devotee, real chart. This is an intelligent devotee born to get money effortlessly due to past life merit. Our ability to attract lasting financial abundance is directly related to the amount of religious merit we have accrued. But not all wealth comes through good deeds. People do become rich in unrighteous ways. The Tudakurao speaks of such wealth. A fortune amassed by fraud may appear to prosper, but will all too soon perish altogether. There it goes. <laughs> it is easy to see other practical advantages of giving. Our reputation grows in the community. Our circle of friends expands. We become someone people want to associate with, want to do business with, and yes, want to give to. That doesn't happen with people who are stingy and selfish. Third verse from the Tudukara adds another aspect to giving. It reads, Charity's merit cannot be measured by gifts given. It is measured by measuring the receiver's merits. If you haven't heard that one before, you may not understand. So what's the meaning of this verse? It's not the amount you give, it's the receiver's merits. What a brilliant insight and so counter to common thinking. It is natural to presume that giving $100 would create more merit than giving $50. But the saint tells us it's just not about the money. It's also about the merit of the recipient. Giving a little to a man of great spiritual attainment is more meritorious than giving a lot to an ordinary beggar. Gurudeva spoke of this concept. Karma is an unfailing natural law, simply explained by this example. Give a beggar 10 rupees. You are not giving, you are investing in your future. Somehow 20 rupees will find its way back to you. He has given you the opportunity to give. When we give expecting to receive, the law will still work, but if we give 10 rupees, we give back 10 rupees. Unselfish giving doubles the return. Giving to a temple is different again. Every 10 rupees given brings back 100 rupees in return. God pays a better interest. <laughs> God pays a better interest. Giving is an investment in the future. It is not parting with something. Then we get our story. You can learn more about charity's efficacy from a story I heard about the Natukota Cheriyars at Palvani Hills Temple appropriate day for this story, an account documented in the temple's pond leaf manuscripts. 
begins around 1600 with the arrival in Palani Township of Kumar Appan from Chetty Nod District in India's southern region. Kumar Appan was the first merchant to establish a salt trade in the region of Palani. He stayed in the house of the Palani temple priest and operated his business in the nearby street. From the beginning, he marked up his margin of profit by one eighth. That's 12.5%. <clears throat> and gave the markup as a mahimai, offering to the deity of Palani Temple, Lord Velayudha. Mahimai is a Tamil word for donation to charity consisting of a fixed percentage of profit, income or harvested crops. Fixed percentage. Kumarappan's donations were used in part to buy food that was cooked by the priest's wife and offered to the deity by the priest. So successful was he that four years later he brought five more salt traders to Palani. All followed his example of offering Mahimai to the temple and all flourished. News of their success reached the Pandian king in Madurai and Ishaniya Shivacharya, the king's guru, chief Saivai priest of South India, at whose behest Kumarapan established an annual pilgrimage to Palani, which is popular to this day. Later, when entrusted with managing all funds donated to the temple, he established an endowment to provide food and shelter for pilgrims. Not only did the salt trader's generosity bring him and his clan material success and social prominence, supported pilgrims and built up the resources of Polony Hills Temple, so much so that today it is one of India's richest temples. How can we determine how much to give <clears throat> to religious endeavors? See what you think. How can we determine this? One, <clears throat> one guideline for this comes from the Dharma Shastras, which caution that <clears throat> a householder should never give gifts beyond his means, live within your budget, should not make his family and dependents suffer on account of his generosity. In his Hindu encyclopedia, Swami Harsh Ananda notes that these Shastras suggest 10% of earnings as a general guideline right in the Dharma Shastras, 10%. And they extol giving as a sacred act that helps even relig earn religious merit and conquer greed. Fine looking Swami. Bengaluru. I met him there once. Our own fellowship of devotees has as its core a membership that, that a membership of initiates that give 10% of their gross income through the support of our mission monastery and monks. But we are not alone. Consider this verse still followed today by members of the Gujarat-based BAPS Swami Narayan Sansta, written some 200 years ago by Bhagwan Swami Narayan. <clears throat> My disciples shall give in donation one-tenth of their income or food grains for the farmers, if that be their agricultural income in the service of Lord Krishna. BAPS is one of Hinduism's most wealthy and dynamic spiritual institutions. How much stronger and more effective would Hinduism be if all Hindus followed these guidelines tied to the institution of their choice? Useful way to assess the extent of one means, one's means to give is to create, if we don't already have one, a detailed monthly household budget showing income in all the major categories of expense, such as rent or mortgage, transportation, food, clothing, and religious giving. No matter if your income is small or large, a valid approach is to start with a modest donation to your favorite religious institution that easily fits into your household budget. As that regular giving crews merit, which in turn attracts more abundance into your life, 
you will be able to periodically increase the amount of your religious donations up to the ideal of 10%. Some individuals may have the ability to give more than 10%, such as those who are single or those who are self-employed, <coughs> as exemplified by our salt merchant Kumarappan. The best way to approach religious giving is make it the first expense when you receive your paycheck. This has a number of advantages. You do not forget to make your donation. You do not spend that money on yourself and find you are unable to give to your religion this month. Because you have made the religious donation your first priority, you become more conservative when faced with buying unnecessary or frivolous things. Many Hindus do not give in a systematic way to the Hindu institution they support, such as a local temple or ashram. Instead, they wait to be asked for a donation which they are willing to give when asked. Compare this to setting aside money for retirement. How many people rely on their investment manager to call and remind them to send in funds for their retirement account? None. People are consistent knowing they will benefit. Similarly, it is beneficial both to you and the institution you support to be just as regular in your charitable giving and not wait to be asked. You benefit because your religion is strengthened and you don't miss months when you weren't reminded, thereby lose the merit of that giving. And the institution benefits by receiving steady, reliable stream of income. In conclusion, consistent, ardent giving to religious institutions, to God, is the duty of all Hindus. <clears throat> the abundance of merit you earn by giving regularly and generously. Creates for you through the law of karma, greater spiritual rewards, worldly success, and financial abundance in this and future lives. Second topic begins with a short review of the Tamil statement Suma Iru. So this is just for anyone who didn't see this before, because you need to know it for what follows. Suma, silently, quietly, in perfect peace and rest. That's the statement. Suma Iru means be silent, quiet, in perfect peace and rest. For today's presentation, I will be reading the talk I gave on the occasion of Yoga Swami's 2023 Mahasamadhi Samadhi Observances to a Yoga Swami group in Toronto, Canada. So the Yoga Swami's Mahasamadhi, Samadhi, as we probably all know, is between March 15th and April 15th, earlier this year. I used to have to go there, and now, of course, it's all done on Zoom saves all that travel time. So then this is starting the, the talk verbatim. My talk for today is short and focuses on one of Yoga Swami's Mahavakya, great sayings, which is Suma Iru, be still. Yoga Swami, of course, is not talking about not moving the body. But rather, he is talking about not moving the mind, stilling our thinking. If you have ever tried to quiet your mind, you know it is not easy. In fact, the most common statement made to me about meditation is that I try to meditate, but I'm unable to quiet my thoughts. Nevertheless, that is the goal. Yoga Swami gives this description. The Atma is Suma. Movement is for the body and mind. You can experience bliss by remaining summa, like the top which finally comes to rest after spinning round and round. The top will go on spinning as long as the force is there. Yoga Swami also gave us a simple
simple practice, which when mastered makes it easier to eventually steal our thoughts. What do you think it was? Learn to remain summa. If you try to stop it, it will only become more active. It is not necessary to stop it. You must ask it, where are you going? But see that you do not leave your seat. A story about Markandu Swami elaborates on this idea. There was a Saivite hermit, the Venerable Markandu Swami, living in a humble mud hut in Sri Lanka. He was very old when we met him in the 1970s and was for many years a disciple of Yoga Swami. The fact is, every utterance was a quote from his guru. One afternoon at his hut, he described Yoga Swami's approach to dealing with thoughts during meditation. He said, Yoga Swami said, realize self by self. You want to read this book, that book, and all these books. The book of infinite knowledge is here, pointing to his chest. You'd better open your own book. The prescription he gave me to open that book is this. When you are in meditation, you watch the mind. Here and there, the mind is hopping. One, two, three, a hundred. In a few seconds, the mind goes to a hundred places. Let him be. You also watch very carefully. Here and there, this mind is running. Let him go anywhere. But if he goes to a hundred places, you must follow him to a hundred places. You must not miss even a single one. Follow him a note. He is going there. Now he is going there. You must not miss even a single one. That is the prescription Sadhguru Yogaswami gave me to open this inner book. He said, watch very attentively and learn to pick up things coming from within. Those messages are very valuable. You can't value them. Realize self by self, open this inner book. Why don't you open your own book? Why don't you make use of it? What an easy path I am prescribing for you. So that's an easier practice. And when we get good at that, it naturally leads up to summa iru. So you simply watch the mind think without losing track of what it's thinking about. It's so easy to just forget that you're thinking Forget that you're watching and get wrapped up in your thoughts and not remember where you went. So watch everyone. Gurudeva made a related statement. We can see that from the mystic's point of view, he is the watcher, and as the mirror is in no way discolored by what it reflects, so is the mystic in his perfected state. Your perfected state, too, as the watcher, is right there, deep within you. In other words, if, your, if awareness has moved into the state of consciousness of unhappiness and then awareness moves into the state of consciousness as happiness, awareness is like the mirror. It's the same in both states. It hasn't changed. It's just the state of consciousness that awareness is experiencing is different. But you, the mirror, the watcher, are unchanged. The next time you sit for meditation, follow my guru's advice to us all and witness your thoughts. Be that stationary awareness, holding form in its own perfection. All you have to do is to watch your mind think. Then and only then are you experiencing your perfect state of inner being. The only difference between the yani and the novice is that the yani stays in there longer it's the watcher, whereas the novice experiences this only momentarily from time to time. In the Saiva Agama, the Sanskrit word for being the watcher or the witness is sakshin, Tamil word, sakchi. I asked Google Translate how to say be a witness in Tamil, and it suggested sakchiyaha, yiru, which can be also translated as stay alert 
or be vigilant. In other words, in striving to eventually reach the state of being still, summa iru, it is helpful to first perfect being a witness, satchiyahat iru. Two quotes from Yoga Swami, to conclude are, one method is to stop all thoughts. Another method is to remain simply as a witness, allowing thoughts to come and go. Excellent summary of the two approaches. As one becomes more and more mature in this sadhana, thoughts will begin to come from maunam. Be very attentive to those thoughts. All men are beautiful walking flowers. Instead of remaining as a witness and enjoying all this, man suffers through being possessed by the disease of I and mine. And that's where we conclude. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>